a great pleasure to be here at Wake Forest, uh, and I know we're crunched for time, so I'll be as uh, short as I can uh, in my remarks. Uh, during the Civil War's first 18 months, Abraham Lincoln fervently hoped that late unionism, rumored to be prevalent in the Upper South, would quickly revive once secessionists were driven from power and local men of proven loyalty were put in their place. By giving freedom and voice to suppressed anti-Confederate populace, the, the foundation stone then would be laid for winning back all citizens' allegiance and trust. The presence of federal troops would permit Southern Unionists to play a significant role in restoring their state, their state's proper relation to the Union, and speed an end to the rebellion with minimal abrasion. Heeding the advice of prominent Southern Loyalists, Lincoln's initial war policies based on restoration, not reconstruction, that's a word that sort of comes into the parlance later on, uh, Lincoln's policies of restoration were conservatively tailored uh, so that the institutions and infrastructure of the South would be as altered, as little altered as possible. This would encourage unionist sentiments supposedly said to be bubbling just beneath the surface. The test of these policies and the men charged with implementing them would be on display in North Carolina and their success or failure helped determine the eventual course of federal reconstruction policy. The advance of Union armies in early 1862 compelled the Lincoln administration to grapple with the mechanics of just how occupied territories were to be administered and reconstructed. Positive public reaction to the selection of loyalist Andrew Johnson of Tennessee as military governor of Tennessee encouraged Lincoln to appoint similar officials in other federal, in other federal held enclaves. Convinced by North Carolina's initial rejection of secession and buoyed by the capture of New Bern and most of the state's coastal sounds, the president concluded that loyalist sentiments might spark a full-blown restoration movement if a capable leader could be found. To, to spearhead such a challenging and delicate mission, Lincoln was advised to appoint Edward Stanley, a North Carolina native and a well-known unionist, regarded, as, regarded by many uh, as both skilled and able, if also temperamental and combative. Although now residing in California, Stanley seemed to be an excellent choice as governor. His, fa his family had long held leadership roles in North Carolina and he had enjoyed a distinguished political career in Congress and was a known foe of what he called the Calhoun-inspired destructionists. And like Lincoln, he had survived the Whig Party's demise by gravitating toward the Republican Party, although he doesn't officially become a full-blown member. Yet even with these favorable advantages, Stanley also came with unrealized drawbacks, among which among probably the most damaging, was his hidebound inability to recognize or to adjust to new political and military currents being stirred by the war, especially those that affected the traditional racial order of things. Uh, moreover, his status as a native son actually made his task more difficult, uh, rather ironically, rather than easier. Uh, and I wanted to include a map just to, to show kind of the federal enclave in North Carolina. This uh, is Stanley's domain, and it's sort of the, the limited territorial reach of Union armies in North Carolina that helps doom uh, Stanley's governorship. While Stanley was surprised to be summoned east from California by his new appointment in April of 1862, he was believed to be an ideal messenger for rallying pro-Union sentiments in North Carolina. And his Tar Heel heritage was in line with Lincoln's inaugural promise not to use, quote, obnoxious strangers, unquote, to fill Southern offices. Born in New Bern in January of 1810, Edward Stanley was one of 14 children of Federalist Congressman John Stanley. And he attended New Bern Academy and then actually went north to Vermont uh, for his university education uh, before being admitted to the bar in 1832. Uh, he then followed, he went into politics 
and served in the federal, the United States House of Representatives for five terms from 1837 to 43 and then again from 49 to 53. And he just missed uh, serving in Congress with Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln's in Congress from 47 to 49. Uh, Stanley comes in uh, right after him uh, for his second stint. Uh, he also serves in the uh, North Carolina State Legislature. Uh, he serves in the State Legislature as Speaker of the General Assembly, and he has a very brief appointment as the Attorney General uh, of North Carolina. Uh, he was known uh, as a distinguished orator uh, with a lofty spirit with quick perception. Stanley had made many warm friends, including New Yorker William H. Seward. But he was also known for having an irritable temper, a sarcastic turn of mind that spared neither friend nor foe, and had made him an equal number of bitter enemies. In 1853, uh, district gerrymand gerrymandering uh, had basically eliminated his district. Uh, he was basically, they would rearranged the electoral map, and as a Whig, uh, he was in the definite minority by this time in North Carolina, and he knew there was, he, he had no chance at re-election. So uh, Stanley, in 1853, packs up and moves to San Francisco, California, uh, where he actually, he'll gravitate toward the Republicans, he'll even make a, a run for a governor of California in 1857, uh, but he also ha knows he has no chance uh, at winning that office either. As was true with other border state families, the 1861 crisis rendering the national fabric forced painful choices on the Stanleys, while two brothers, Edward and Fabius, or Fabius, my Latin's not that great, uh, stood by the Union. Other family members, including nephew Louis A. Armistead, sided with the Confederacy. Both loyal brothers were on the West Coast when war broke out, and it was the lesser known sibling. Uh, Fabius Stanley, a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Navy who first declared his allegiance by refusing to resign his commission. Uh, and he alerted Washington to the fact that armed steamers were needed to protect the California bullion shipments on the West Coast from secessionist uh, attack. In fact, I, I credit uh, Fabius Stanley with helping inspire me to do this paper because in searching for everything Lincoln in the archives, I came across this endorsement on Stanley's letter to uh, uh, a congressman, and Lincoln endorses it. And basically, he says in his letter that he wants no snug berth in this war. Uh, he currently is uh, heading up the, uh, the ship USS Independence, uh, which is not an active duty ship. He wants an active appointment. And this is long before Lincoln appoints his brother as governor, but Lincoln endorses the back saying that he is the brother of the Honorable uh, Edward Stanley, formerly of North Carolina, and I ask respectful attention to his case. Uh, promotion to commander soon followed. And as it turned out, Fabius Stanley, who sought active combat duty, would have a much easier war experience than his brother Edward, uh, whose path was strewn with far more difficulties. In accepting his appointment, uh, when Lincoln appoints Edward Stanley as governor, military governor of North Carolina in uh, 1862, in May, uh, Stanley promises his California friends that he will return with my shield or on my shield. And he believes that his mission is to hold out an olive branch of peace to a people, quote, always pat patriotic and as remarkable for their modesty and devotion to the Union as for patriotism and bravery, who never freely yielded to evil influences or consented to, to a separation until goaded to it by wicked stratagem." Unquote. Arriving in Washington in mid-May 1862, Stanley met with Lincoln and was assured of cordial cooperation of the military authorities in North Carolina. Uh, but the War Department does not give him very detailed instructions, other than basically reestablish the national authority, do what you need to do. You, you'll be on the scene in the local area, you'll know what needs to be done, uh, and we will back you up. Uh, in fact, that was the advice the War Department basically gave to all the military governors uh, that were appointed. 
Stanley was supposed to be commissioned a brigadier general. After all, he's a military governor. Uh, but of all the military governors appointed, Stanley either request, I'm, I'm sure he requested not to have that commission sent to the Senate for confirmation. He basically didn't want to come back to North Carolina in draped in military guise. Uh, he thought that perhaps wouldn't go over well. But it also then raises questions later by his political enemies that he's Ill illegitimate, that he has, in a sense, no legal commission to be doing what he's doing. Uh, arriving in North Carolina for the first time in a decade, Stanley found his authority and physical reach limited, uh, and that the breakdown of law and order in outlying areas contested between Union and Confederate forces had caused many local whites to flee to Confederate-held territory, and freedmen or, or contraband slaves to come into federal law. Uh, and indeed, it was this issue, what to do about these escaped slaves, that really will uh, doom Stanley's governorship. Uh, faced with a complicated and fluid situation, Stanley's governorship was hampered on the outset by his own entrenched conservatism and his seeming inability to recognize that the perceptions, the attitude, the mood in North Carolina had changed in the decade that he had been gone. Basically, Stanley comes back to North Carolina and he still thinks everyone has the same mindset as in 1850. Uh, and that also is going to cause uh, him a great deal of difficulty. He has a real hard time uh, sort of reading the public pulse. Uh, also shackling his effectiveness was uh, he does not possess, unlike Andrew Johnson in Tennessee, Union forces do not occupy the state capital. Uh, Stanley does not, in a sense, have control of the state bureaucracy or at least the guise of legitimacy that he is the legitimate governor of uh, the state. Um, Stanley clings to this belief that North, Carolin North Carolinians were still largely pro-union, and if allowed, free expression of their wishes and opinions would separate themselves from the Confederacy. However, it was increasingly clear to most people, aside from Stanley, that true unionism, that is, unmitigated hostility to the Confederacy, and a willingness to risk life and property to uphold it was at a minimum uh, in the region. Now this change in sentiment among people who had Stanley had been very intimately associated with uh, in all his life previous uh, was inexplicable. He, he couldn't fathom it. Uh, his own brother Alfred wished the earth would open him up, uh, would open up and swallow him uh, if he accepted a Republican commission. Uh, his family cousin, George E. Badger, who's a former Secretary of the U.S. Navy, uh, decried or scoffed, saying that a governor that derives his authority from the commission of Mr. Lincoln would be well advised to abandon his enterprise. His very title is an insult to us. And furthermore, uh, that if he wished the name of Stanley to become a byword for re reproach and scorn, uh, by North, spoken of by North Carolinians, henceforth and forever, let him prosecute his present mission. Well, Stanley attempts to do just that. He goes on a speaking tour of the, the counties that are occupied, and Stanley believes that he is seeing unionism uh, regenerate. But what is also happening at the same time Stanley is appointed and taking office is that by mid-1862, in basically every theater of war, uh, Union soldiers are discovering that these tales of repressed Southern Unionists are not as grand as they've been led to believe, and that basically they're in the midst of a hostile population instead. And uh, it's the soldiers that really first begin applying what becomes known as the hard hand of war in confiscating or destroying Southern property, uh, at being very suspicious of Southerners who even take the, the oath of allegiance, whether they really mean it or not, uh, and Stanley vociferously complains uh, that, in a sense, Union troops in North Carolina are the problem. Um, and he also says that, look, a lot of them are from New England, they're infected with abolitionism, uh, and that just is not going to, to go down well uh, here. And, and he is very antagonistic uh, toward the military command uh, of uh, or in his uh, area of North Carolina. In fact, he later will make the claim that, well, 
had the Union soldiers been Christians and gentlemen, uh, North Carolina would have rapidly returned to her allegiance. And such sentiments uh, led Stanley's critics to note that perhaps uh, he was ill-suited to be a military government and, quote, uh, perhaps a far more fit representative of the rebel confederacy than the national government. Uh, Stanley is also accused of being too soft on uh, pro-confederates. He, he gives out passes uh, rather indiscriminately. Uh, but the most difficult knot that Stanley faces as military governor is what to do about large numbers of escaped slaves crowding into Newburgh. Uh, and conversely, what then were the rights of loyal slave owners? Uh, could runaway slaves be, be prevailed upon or compelled to return to their former masters? Uh, was North Carolina's antebellum slave code still to be enforced, irrespective of wartime conditions? The governor believed the latter was the case, and cautioned but did not order the army to close, uh, the army su appointed superintendent of the poor, Vincent Collier, had opened uh, two schools for the children of escaped slaves and one for local whites. Um, Stanley, again, he doesn't order him to close them, but he says that those schools violate the old order of things. Uh, Collier then immediately closes them and goes north to complain directly to Lincoln in the company of Senator Charles Sumner. Uh, he also talks a lot to the newspapers, giving very colorful, if somewhat dubious, accounts of Stanley's activities. Uh, again, this is where it's ginning up in the northern press that Stanley is soft on rebels, he's returning slaves, uh, he's doing all these things that he probably shouldn't be doing. And there were some in the North, and probably Lincoln privately too, recognized that what Stanley was trying to do was assure North Carolinians that you know, uh, uh, Lincoln wants to restore the antebellum status quo, that your property will be safe. Uh, but uh, Lincoln himself says that if Stanley thinks that we're just going to turn the clock back to 1860 and pretend the war isn't going on, uh, he is under a misapprehension. Uh, and that really, Stanley, frankly, is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Uh, if he returns slaves to owners, uh, even if they, they, you know, they say that they're loyal, uh, the press in the North Congress, the army will criticize him. If he doesn't do so, local North Carolinians, the very people he has come to conciliate, uh, will hate him. He can trim his sails to whatever breeze but in vain. Uh, while ever a staunch unionist, uh, Stanley found that the increasing radicalization of the war, both in aims and prosecution, and the concomitant drift toward emancipation, uh, was highly unpalatable. As a native-born Southern and former slaveholder with paternalistic views of the institution, Stanley believed that slavery was a necessary economic component. Um, that if we're going to conciliate white population, slavery must be protected. In fact, he tells the administration that unless I can give them some assurance that this is a war of restoration and not of abolition and destruction, no peace can be restored here for many years to come. But what Stanley could not recognize, but Lincoln could, by the fall of 1862 was that converging military, political, and diplomatic necessities required that slavery be attacked directly. Although any complete reordering of the Southern social structure was not at that time envisioned. In a personal interview with the president that September, Lincoln told the governor, according to Stanley, and his account is slightly uh, uh, dubious, perhaps, uh, that the Emancipation Proclamation was being forced on him. The radical Republicans basically were threatening to um, not stop the war, but uh, put such pressure to bear that the army could not fight the war, uh, and that he had to do this. Uh, but Lincoln then tries to soothe him over, saying that, look, I, I approve of what you've been doing. You, it has my approbation. Uh, continue, go back to North Carolina, and hold elections, because Lincoln tells him, if North Carolina, if the districts in North Carolina have representation in Congress, they are exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation. 
And he tries to get Stanley to move on that, uh, and Stanley drags his feet. And when it finally happens, and the man that Stanley wanted uh, elected to Congress, Congress refuses to seat him. Uh, but it's this issue, what to do about the slaves, the former slaves, that really uh, concern Stanley. He, and the questions that Stanley is asking are questions that will sort of haunt the nation almost for the next, well, literally for the next century. He, he asks, uh, what is to be their status? Uh, are they to be furnished with land? Are they to remain in the South? Uh, and he, say, he predicts that non-slaveholding whites are not going to, you know, how are they going to react in competing uh, with freedmen for uh, jobs? Finding answers to these questions would, as I said, plague the nation for the next uh, century. Uh, sensing the failure of what he calls his mission of love, uh, after only 10 months in office, Stanley resigns. He officially resigns in January 1863, uh, but he actually is in office in North Carolina until March. And he tells a, a private friend that his departure was unavoidable, having told our people, or quote, having told our people that the government would restore property to loyal men and would secure all their constitutional rights. How can I say that after the proclamation of the 1st of January? Uh, in fact, Stanley says that perhaps a northerner with a kind heart uh, will do a better job here than I can, because he would not be so as opposed as the, uh, by the abolitionists as I have been. Uh, well, in March 1863, Stanley leaves North Carolina. He uh, has one more conference with Lincoln, and then he goes back to California. Uh, and Lincoln decides not to reappoint or to appoint a new military governor, basically by mid-1863, Lincoln is concerned that this hybrid civil military uh, uh, military governorship is not working the way he originally had hoped. Uh, Stanley then goes back to his 1,500-acre ranch in California and resumes his practice of law. But in early 1864, word comes that there are there's widespread anti-Confederate sentiments that are boiling up in North Carolina in some of the recent elections there. And Stanley telegraphs Lincoln saying that if the country needs my services, not as governor, I am ready to come. Well, remembering Stanley's difficulties in office, Lincoln sends a noncommittal response saying that, you know, I would love to have you go back amongst your friends in North Carolina, but in what respect, I don't have anything to suggest yet. Certainly Stanley, and. The, the Emancipation Proclamation really sticks in Stanley's crawl. Uh, in fact, in the, and as I said, Stanley, his whole life, he was a Whig. He, he, to his dying day, he calls himself an inveterate old line Whig. And in 1864, in the, the presidential election, Stanley backs the Democrat, uh, George B. McClellan. Uh, for, for a Whig to back a Democrat uh, is mind-blowing, at least one of Stanley's you know, he clings to his Whig ideology uh, with the fervor of religion, but he believes that basically the Emancipation Proclamation is going to cause Southerners to fight a 50-year war. Uh, that even if uh, Lee's army is captured, even if Charleston is captured, that this war will go on. It will become a guerrilla war. It will be, uh, you know, all the horrors of servile war, which Stanley imagined is going to happen. Well, six months after Stanley publishes this very public letter uh, announcing that he's going to support McClellan and the reasons why, and again, it's all about the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, he even says um, that if the, the Emancipation Proclamation had not been issued, North Carolina would have called a convention and taken steps to cancel the ordinance of secession and return her allegiance to the general government. I think this illustrates in a nutshell the flights of fancy or this wishful thinking that Stanley was prone to. Uh, Stanley also tries to meet with um, Zebulon Vance, the Confederate governor of North Carolina, uh, privately in a very unofficial way, and is snubbed. Uh, by it. And then Stanley is a person, he can't, he can't just let something go, he has to then respond at length, uh, which he does, and then publishes uh, much of his correspondence. Uh, but Stanley's governorship, was, military governorship of North Carolina was a failure. 
But the failure was not due to his personal or political shortcomings alone. Uh, the lack of very specific uh, official instructions regarding his power and purpose, uh, the limited territorial occupation, an overestimation of the strength of Southern Unionism, and frankly, the failure of McClellan's campaign to take Richmond in 1862 doomed Stanley's best efforts. If he'd failed in North Carolina, it was also because he had been asked to achieve a Herculean task that conflicted both with his entrenched political and racial beliefs. And uh, the Lincoln administration is not without fault here as well. They, they appointed Stanley military governor largely based, it seems, on the strength of his reputation. He was a prominent Southern Unionist. Uh, he'd make a great governor, so it was thought. Uh, but no one had really considered, for 10 years, Stanley's been in California. He's been sort of on both the geographic and political periphery of the nation. Uh, he doesn't really have a full sense, I don't think, of what, what was going on. Uh, and of course, there was lack of clear directives, and the administration then did not fire him or remove him as soon it was, as it was clear that he opposed key administration policies, specifically emancipation. Uh, although the war's ongoing friction and embrasion made a mockery of Stanley's hopes for consolidating North Carolina unionism by preserving slavery, he nevertheless was correct in predicting the, the bitter resistance of white Southerners towards the changes wrought by emancipation. Stanley also found, uh, like other true unionists, uh, those unionists that he tried to rally and protect, uh, they found, both he and they found, that the war continued even after the fighting ended, as former friends and neighbors refused to overlook their siding with the enemy. Community ostracism caused many to relocate elsewhere, and Stanley himself felt that he could never again return to North Carolina, saying, quote, there's too much sorrow there. The Stanleys, like other border state families, uh, divided by the Civil War, found the choices they made at the start of the, the conflict impacted the rest of their lives, with familial breaches sometimes never healed. Both Edward and Fabius, Fabius uh, never returned again to their native state. While neither of the Stanley brothers had sought a snug berth during the roiling tempest of the Civil War, it was Edward who was most battered by the struggle and the thorny question, and the thorny questions he posed concerning the status and fate of the freedmen would continue the ha to haunt the country for the next century. Would Lincoln have called upon Stanley, had he lived, uh, to help implement post-war reconstruction in North Carolina? Hardly likely, uh, owing to his ineffective tenure as governor uh, and towards emancipation. But at least Stanley died, uh, he dies in 1872, uh, at least Stanley died knowing that the bear of secession that he had fought for so long had been slain, and that the federal union that he had been taught to rever revere in his cradle uh, would endure. Thank you.